Hey everyone, I'm Bruce and you're listening to Clearly Unfiltered, a short form podcast that offers clear, concise, unfiltered and undoubtedly flawed thoughts on how and why I'm butchering some of my own sacred cows. In each episode, I'm going to let those steaks sizzle and serve them up at medium rare or blue and now and again, well done or charred. In the mini episode I released a month ago, I highlighted my wrestling with the privilege I hold as a cishet white man. That episode is actually a precursor to this one, so if you have the time, check that one out first. It's not long at all. This episode was meant to release two weeks back, but for a number of reasons, my friend Ayanda and I could not record then, and I've also had a ton going on and haven't really had the emotional energy to produce this episode in a way that gives the topic justice. So I waited. But as it turns out, everything aligned this week and it's all come together. Before I share part one of my conversation with my good friend Ayanda Zaka, it seems apt that this delayed episode releases a mere day after Youth Day in South Africa. Youth Day, for those of you who don't know, is a day set apart to recognize the bravery of protesters in Soweto, led predominantly by high school students who demonstrated against the South African apartheid regime's enforced introduction of Afrikaans as a medium of teaching in schools on June 17, 1976. On this day, thousands of students mobilized by the South African Students' Movement marched peacefully to demonstrate and protest. Events that triggered the uprising can be traced back to policies of the apartheid government that resulted in the introduction of the Bantu Education Act in 1953. The march was meant to end in a rally in Orlando Stadium, but on their way there, heavily armed police fired tear gas and live ammunition on demonstrating students, killing 23 young people on that first day. Some reports put the death toll as high as 200 killed by the police in the protests that followed in other communities. So before Ayanda and I talk about supremacy, particularly in relation to race, please take a moment with me to remember the brave youth who marched and died for the right to learn, for the right to not be suppressed intellectually because of race. In part one of this episode, Supremacy, Ayanda and I talk about the power of friendship, supremacy in the context of race, and false narratives that support supremacy. Ayanda also shares really vulnerably about some of his own experiences and challenges the presumption that, based on skin color, some people hold more value than others. It is super exciting for me to be sitting with you, Ayanda. Thank you. <laughs> As a, yeah, I think we've, we've wanted to do this for ages, so um, it's wonderful. Um, and Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, and we're just going to have a light conversation today about supremacy. <laughs> Very light. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but before we get into that, um, and I think it's an important conversation, and part of the reason I'm having this conversation with you is A because of our friendship and because of what I've learned from our friendship. So I want to start by talking a little bit about that. But the, the second part of it is, you know, the whole aim of this podcast is to, is to challenge some of those sacred cows in my own life. And, and you know some of my journey in understanding my own inherent racism and how I've spent years trying to unpack that mm. and be better and acknowledge the space I hold in the world. And I, I referred to some of that in the previous episode. So I'm really excited to unpack some of this with you. But before we dive into that, um, I want to ask you to introduce yourself because I could say wonderful things about what an amazing friend you are and how much I've learned from you. And that'll come up, I think, in conversation. But I think you'll best be able to tell the people who are listening who you are and it's a, uh, I mean, introducing myself is always for me such a, like, what do you say about yourself? <laughs> you tell them you grew up in a small village, <laughs> you live in Pretoria. Um, but I suppose it's more about what, what one wants to, 
to be known for, I imagine. Um, I'm a father, I'm a husband, three kids live in Pretoria. I enjoy sports, although I'm not a fanatic. Support the Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are uh, overseas, the Sharks are a South African rugby franchise. Um, yeah, I, I, I work in diversity and inclusion, as you know. I'm passionate about it wouldn't be the correct term. It more would be a sense of purpose that I feel, a sense of responsibility that I feel to, to help, to contribute, to challenge, to um, challenge. You know, whatever I see in the world, because of just my experience and how I grew up, um, even as I say, landing up here in Pretoria in the early 2000s, which was a very different city than what it is now. And you're still working through a lot of those issues. Mm. But um, yeah, I just feel a responsibility. And that's why I'm in this very difficult job that I do. Um, but I, I, I get gratified when I see people and relationships become better and people feel more capacitated to to live um, more freely and enjoy more of life than what I think they were otherwise would if they just lived in segregated, isolated spaces or ways of thinking. Uh, maybe it's a bit <laughs> altruistic, but that's what I try to do. <laughs> I want to jump in there, Ayanda, because I think, I think in many ways our friendship is, I think, a picture of what you're talking about there. And so maybe at the beginning to, because this is my podcast. And <laughs> you can do that. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> I, I wanted, I wanted maybe to unpack that a little. We've, we've had conversations about our friendship yeah. before. And I think we've dreamt about, you know, if people who grew up differently, particularly in polarized societies like South Africa, people like you and me, probably on vastly different ends of, of what happened in South Africa in our childhood. Um, if we're able to come together and have these rigorous conversations about things that matter and are able to challenge one another and are able to grow together, like that yeah. should be a picture of, yeah. well, I think would be a beautiful picture of what can happen if people are willing to learn and grow together. And that's what... Absolutely. I mean, we, we kind of stumbled across each other um, <laughs> thanks to a mutual friend. But yeah. you know, maybe what is that for you in terms of what works for us? I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking back to the very first phone call that we had. Um, and I remember exactly where I was that day. It sounds very real. <laughs> Me too. I, 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 I say to people when I speak of you, Bruce, like I'm unashamed, unashamedly <laughs> in the, what are they what are they? <laughs> In a, in a bromance, <laughs> like I've totally owned it. And maybe that for me is, is if we could have more friendships like that, and I wouldn't say that I, I want to hold our friendship up to, to people mm -hmm. as the model friendship, but the way that I feel and how invested I am in it, it's, it's, it's an all in investment. And part of that is also because of how I think you've, stepped into um, into the friendship. And I think from the beginning um, and that phone call, not knowing even what you look like or had no cooking clue in my mind <clears throat> what you're like on the other end. But I found you open and um, in a sense vulnerable to what would be a stranger. Um, and I just, that, that was unique for me. I didn't have that. And of course the first meeting then after that, meeting you and your wife and your, and your kids, I think part, a lot of that also positioned um, the way that our friendship, I think, would progress and it's been affirmed and affirmed over the times that you've met um, in terms of how you engage with me. And of course, I, pre I hope, should I say, that I've done that well too towards you. Uh, but it's of course difficult to judge oneself <laughs> about how good you are being <laughs> in a friendship. But uh, what, I've, what I've loved and appreciated, and I've said this multiple times to you, is that I've never had a feeling of having been treated with in a devalued manner in the friendship itself. And within the context of our country, that is probably the default or the, the, the default positioning of relationships between white and black or white people and people of color is that there's always that misalignment in that mm -hmm. uh, in a default level and i just have never had that with you i've ha only ever had a sense of being valued um, and not just valued as a person 
physically in the skin color, but the the opinions, the the thoughts. Like you you want to know my thoughts. It's not just you telling me your thoughts, and that's you know that's um, the nature of the relationship. So I really feel valued in the friendship, and that's why you know I I feel like I can entrust some of the things that what I think are valuable to me thoughts that are not complete or feelings and questions that I have which are controversial whatever the case may be I can come to Bruce and know that there's there's not going to be any judgment or any devaluing or any it's not going to upset the dynamics between us that I feel is secure and so far I mean I learned well, you say you learned from me I'm learning from you <laughs> where there's but yeah maybe you should stop because I'm not going to be able to get out the door eh? <laughs> My head is so big. I have enough, like in my in my tank for a couple of months now. You, yeah. You're way too kind, eh? and I yeah. think I, I value the same thing. I think you know there are many issues. I think that we talk about where we might stand on different sides of the fence. And what I've appreciated is is just being able to be honest and you know without judgment and and work out things together. And I and I think what I have particularly appreciated and I think this is key in in our friendship for me is you have given me the space to wrestle through issues where where you know I I, I don't feel I need to guard what I say because I know that you understand my heart and and you know I, I I think I think we do need to be aware of how the things we say are perceived particularly when we haven't lived in someone else's shoes, but I, I felt real freedom with you to ask questions that I might not feel the freedom to ask anywhere else and and to learn and to grow. And I think I'm a significantly better person for, for our relationship. And I know, I know that as people listen to this, they're going to understand why I feel that way. So I want to, I want to dive into this topic we want to wrestle with. And, and I think, this might be a multiple sort of part episode, either two or three parts, depending on where we go with this. Um, but I want to start just from your experience, uh, both as I think a person of color living in a country that historically hasn't been friendly to people like yourselves. And I think in many ways still is not, but also because of your experience, you spoke about being a practitioner in diversity and inclusion issues in schools and corporate spaces or whatever. When you think about supremacy, um, you know, it's probably difficult to define, but, but, but in your experience of, of that word, you know, as we start this conversation, what, what are your thoughts about supremacy? Hmm. Uh, it's a, a very broad topic, of course. Um, and I think what probably people would be most familiar with would be what they see in the media. Um, we don't have to look too far in our country to think of what the National Party, for example, did um, in instituting apartheid and um, racial segregation. If we look to the states and we think of groups like the KKK mm -hmm. and what white supremacy looks like um, in a form in that uh, context, I mean, there are various places we could look. You can look to Australia um, in in many places. Look, uh, even in terms of colonialism, the idea that a group of people, um, by virtue of what are, could I say, God-given attributes, are inherently then superior over another group that also did not choose their in inherent um, things that they are born with, mm -hmm. notably skin color, that that could be in, in ways of living. It could be various things of how it expresses oneself. But just the idea of people being uh, in a higher position of order of birth than than other people. Mm -hmm. I think that, in a basic summary, is how I see supremacy. And it plays out, it spells out in different uh, ways, mm -hmm. whether it's... and. Uh, I maybe contrast it probably most to to the idea of humility, which in mo most people see as a weakness. But I I think is actually um, it speaks a lot to the person's sense of security within them mm -hmm. to be able to be humble. Um, 
yeah, so I hope that loosely defines, yeah. but there's a lot in there. And I think, I think what stands out for me is, is, and the more we have spoken and the more I have been intentional about trying to learn about this is, is I've realized very much, I think there's a narrative that in, in, in many ways, people believe this narrative that there's equality and, and we're all starting from the same, you know, point. You know, I think particularly in the South African narrative, and that's true for us because we're in this space. But I see it when I look elsewhere as well. Often the people who are in power, who have that supremacy because of who they are, in my mind, feel that everyone's starting from an equal footing. Mm -hmm. But the more I engage with people who are impacted negatively by power dynamics and supremacy, I realize that that's not in fact the case. Mm -hmm. That, that as a white person, I'm going to say this, as a white male, my biases blind me to the fact of the space that I take up and how that impacts other people. And, and, and I think that's really where I want to head with this conversation, Ayanda, because you and I have spoken about this a lot. You've worked in schools, you've worked in corporate. Both of us have been in the church space. And the one thing that I want to challenge with this episode, a multi-part episode, is this idea that supremacy still very much rears its ugly head and shows up in those spaces. And, you know, we probably can't unpack sort of loads of examples or whatever, but I, I wanted to explore a little bit, you know, like as people are listening to this who might be blind to their own supremacy or, you know, to affirm the experience of people who are impacted like this, how, how do you see that showing up in some of those spaces, um, in that power dynamic in schools, in churches, in corporate spaces? Because I think the more we see these things, the more we can start unpacking them and strive for real equity, real inclusion, real belonging, where everyone is sitting around the table, but also, as we often say, everyone's voice around the table matters equally and holds equal weight. So... I'll share two examples fresh from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so at our house, we have a window that looks into what I assume is a kitchen of our neighbors. And so yesterday I was standing out there and it looks out to the west. So it's looking at the sunset and over their house. So it's sitting behind the neighbor's house. <clears throat> and standing there, I've got a hoodie on because it's cold in the house. Um, and then the neighbor comes into the frame of their window and uh, I don't know she was doing whatever she's doing I'm looking at the sunset and then it occurs to me it's a white woman by the way it occurs to me that she might think that I'm I don't know looking into her window mm -hmm. um, and in my mind I'm thinking to myself my goodness knowing what I know about this country white woman black guy in a hoodie what am I, she, she may assume, of course, I don't know for sure, but just understanding the dynamics, I'm like, she might think that, I don't know, I'm, I've got nefarious intent by standing there looking at her, whereas I'm actually, the reason I'm there is in my house, looking at my window at the sunset over her house. So some of those dynamics for me are those, it's not, it's not just the fact that I, I would attribute the idea of supremacy to white people and how they view themselves in isolation, it's also in relation to how I view myself in relation to other people that I'm with in this world. But also the mix between the two is that being black, being male, even though I'm in my house looking at my window, the chances are good that this body that I'm in makes her believe that I've got ill intent. Whereas if it was the same scenario, but white skin, there isn't that assumption of wrongdoing that is built into that situation. Mm -hmm. It could be, I could be just a neighbor looking out into the sunset, but because of the skin color, it, you know, the dynamics change automatically. And just, I'm just struck by that now. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm putting myself in your position. I don't think that thought would even go through mm -hmm. my mind. You know, I might think, uh, okay, this is awkward. Mm -hmm. I don't want her to think I'm, you know, looking at her or whatever, but I wouldn't think anything other than her perception of me as a neighbor. Whereas for you, there's a whole nother layer. It's almost like society has conditioned you to think that your body and the way you present in a hoodie 
is threatening just because yeah. of how it presents. Yeah. Um, I mean, so of course, a lot of this is colored by my own experience and my biases and uh, possibly insecurities too. So I'm aware of that. Um, but I don't think that I'm totally wrong um, in, in that. Um, one other example was uh, at a store waiting in, in a queue to get medication. Um, and I, I, although I don't know the full story because this, um, I kind of overheard from a distance and saw the dynamics between the lady who was helping, a black lady helping a white gentleman with his medication evidently, or somebody else's medication. And she's trying to explain to him that she needs certain information from him to be able to fill the prescription. And um, if I understood correctly, it was on someone else's behalf, but just noting the dynamics and the voice levels as they increase because of this man's inability or lack of desire to actually fulfill the requirements so that he can get uh, the medication to the point where he now starts questioning her um, wanting the head pharmacist or whoever's in charge and lo and behold it actually is her <laughs> so there's an assumption that because she's a black woman she cannot be the pharmacist charge. she cannot be in charge and that's my my perception of course could be wrong that that i mean you, you probably see these dynamics very much is that even not just from white people towards black people but even black people themselves thinking or expecting that if someone is in charge they probably are going to be white and i think if you just look in society at the moment anyway anecdotally you'd be correct but it's that in itself that is that is an issue and a problem because we then um live like that as if that is a reality in all the spaces and that's not true mm. and when i looked at the board for example in this particular store all of the pharmacists were black I've never seen that in, in South Africa. And I actually pointed it out to the lady when I had a chance to speak to her. But the, what I'm trying to say is that the because this particular man, I think, couldn't reconcile the fact that someone was in the authority who didn't look what had he expected, couldn't handle himself in that scenario because there was no sort of recourse now to take it up the chain as it were and to speak to someone like him. Um, how he felt or whatever the case is, I don't know because I never spoke to him. But it's those dynamics in real life that cause issues and friction uh, between people. And I think somewhat unnecessarily because we just we still live with this idea that one person is automatically assumed to be better, more knowledgeable, superior. And another, by virtue of their skin color, is assumed to have negative mm. qualities or cannot attain a particular level. On that sobering point, we're going to push pause. Part two of this conversation will be out in three days on all platforms. In the next part, Yanda and I dive a little deeper into how supremacy shows up in the world and we try to offer some hope for the way forward. Here's to learning more and growing in empathy. Until then, be cool and stay safe.